Hello, everyone. Hello, and uh, thank you for uh, sticking to the very last session. Um, so today I will be talking about uh, polymer and material design. And uh, before we start, I would like to know, well, I was going to ask who is a developer, of course, everyone. Who is a designer here? Any designers? All right, well, who is a design-minded developer? A developer who likes beauty, who likes his applications to be really nice, with a nice user interface. Okay, everyone. Thank you. So this is uh, really about you and about achieving what you want. And since it is the end of the day and uh, you're very tired, let's start with a little video about material design. All right, so now you are all material design experts. No, just kidding. Material design is a design philosophy, so it's not a set of rules that is cast in stone, something that you have to adhere to. Um, I invite you to go and check the documents that are at google.com slash design. I actually find, found it an interesting read, something that really you can read like a novel. Um, it is there to inspire you. So material design, uh, and I'll go through the video uh, in slow motion to explain all the concepts, of course. Uh, but at a high level, the, the fundamental metaphor in material design is a piece of paper, but a kind of magical piece of paper that can stretch, uh, cut, rearrange, and so on. It's also bold, graphical, intentional, uh, and provides a lot of meaning through motion. But let's go back to the video to see that. It has a lot of content, but of course it's very short without the sound. So this is the basic metaphor. A magic paper that stretches, that can cut itself in pieces, but that still feels to the user as uh, a touchable, a palatable interface. Uh, it has a subtle drop shadow, but apart from that, it's all flat. So when I said bold, graphical, intentional, I think that there are three adjectives there because um, the guys writing the manual couldn't make up their mind, but I, I think what they meant was informative. And this actually is, is, a, is a very nice illustration of that. Uh, in this one tile, you understand immediately what this is about. It's red, which means warning, danger, something bad happened. Um, there is the... San Francisco Bridge with a little plane. You know you are flying to San Francisco. It is in relation to that. It says delayed. Now you know what, what is the, the bad thing that happened. And that's it. It's all about glanceable information, providing to your users everything he needs to know as quickly as possible. So next. This is nice. Yes. You see the little red flying dot there. Um, we will uh, actually use it later uh, in this uh, presentation. It's called a floating action button. The idea is there. This is a design pattern you will find a lot uh, in material design. It's one button that floats about above the rest, and that is the, the call to action button, the one action that is most useful in that particular concept context. <clears throat> so here, for instance, in this uh, email application, it's the create new uh, email button. Um, 
Here in this context application, it's the star favorite button and so on. Let's go back to this animation now. I like this animation. Look what it does. Here. And we'll see it again in just a second. Actually, I'll go back to this. Uh, right here. This also you will find very often. It's called the hero element. In transitioning between views or between contexts in your application, uh, you should keep a hero element, something that is constant between the previous and the, the, the source and the target view. Like here, uh, you see the, the cover art of this album was here viewed in a list, and when I click on it, it goes full screen into player mode, but I still see that it's that one album that I will be playing. Can I move this? Yes. Um, for animations, it's very subtle things. Have you seen, let me show this to you once more. Look at the, the volume slider. Here, this little slider. As it appeared, it appears with a very subtle little motion. What is the meaning of that motion? It means you can touch this, you can move this. And it's, it becomes completely evident for the user when he sees the little knob moving there. So again here, motion, that animations that provide meaning. Um, let's go back a little bit more. Actually, this was interesting too. Uh, when we said that the style was bold, graphical, and intentional, it's also colorful. And one design pattern that you will see a lot is that you use contextual colors. Actually, in the, in the latest release of, of Android in Lollipop, you even have a function for extracting the dominant color from something so that, so that you can use it in um, your UI. Uh, so here you see the, the backgrounds of the titles. They use a color that is extracted from the album art. All right, and I think that's about it. Let's play to the end. I don't think I have forgotten anything yet. That should be it. So magical paper, informative, uh, a call to action everywhere. Oh yes, and it's touch first. This actually wasn't very visible in the video. Um, but there is um, a slight paradigm shift that uh, this design style is meant for touch devices first, and what that means is that elements that you touch come to you, as opposed to buttons in a normal web page that go down when you press on them. Uh, this is very subtle. All right, so that's a very short version of material design. Please go read the design documents on google.com slash design. Now, I want to play with it. So, first, a little introduction to Polymer. What is Polymer? Uh, Polymer is uh, Google's implementation on top of web components, uh, which is a web standard that finally makes it possible in HTML to use imports and encapsulated components. So, the, the nitty gritty of the spec is a bit complicated. Uh, in two days, actually, uh, there is a full hour conference where I will explain the, the nitty-gritty too. Um, but Polymer makes it much more usable and friendly and easy to make uh, those uh, re reusable encapsulated elements. And as part of the collection of elements we, have, uh, we deliver with Polymer, we have paper elements which use those material design principles, and now I would like to use some of them and, and show you what, what this can do. Uh, there is a very nice uh, paper element sampler uh, on the web. You'll find it easily uh, with checkboxes, for instance. Cute little animation. I, I, I like it. Uh, what else? Um, I like the sliders here also, for, for instance. Brightness slider. Nice. All right. Let's go and write an application. So, 
the really magical thing about web components and Polymer is that your components come as one tag, and it's your tag. So for instance here, there is, you can see it, yes you can. Um, this element, which I have created, it's imported here, so this is a new import statement in HTML, link rel equals import. It points to a piece of HTML which also has JavaScript and CSS and all of that totally encapsulated and totally independent from the rest of your page. Let's run this. I have a little piece of paper. Nice. Uh, what else can I do? Well, this uh, element actually supports uh, what other HTML elements support. So, uh, it can have attributes. This one, for example, uh, this paper card is something I created. I will show you the code in a couple of minutes. Uh, here I can have a heading. Hello world. All right. And uh, the element has syntax, I'll go into that later, uh, that specifies where the text of the heading goes into the element itself, which is built using HTML and, uh, and CSS. And I can also inject content into it. Let's try with an image. SVG, here we go. Live coding. All right. So here I injected an image into the tag, and by some magic, that image ended up in the right location in my element. Let's put some. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to show you. So, what is the magic? Of course, you're asking. Let's go and have a look. The a polymer element is just this. Pretty easy, isn't it? All right, we'll go slowly. So, this is what my paper, little paper element looks like. First, it starts with a polymer element and a name. The name has to have a dash. Um, that's just a way of protecting the exi existing HTML and, and uh, existing tags. Anything that has a dash is something someone created. Everything else has no dash. Here, my element can export attributes. Here I'm saying this element will support, look, heading. That's what I just used. I tell that my element will support an attribute heading, which will do something inside. But this is the interface. Um, inside I have a template. So that's a big part of the web components, web components spec. This template will be stamped out everywhere I use the element. Uh, the template has a style. I'll come back to the styling. Uh, don't worry about the CSS. And now look at the DOM. Here I'm using standard HTML to describe what this element does. This piece of DOM, it's called the shadow DOM because it will not actually appear in your DOM tree if you try to read through it in JavaScript on your page. It's isolated. Of course, uh, there are ways of drilling down into it, both in JavaScript and in CSS. This is HTML, so if you want full power, you have full power. But by default, by importing an element from the outside, from a library, it's not going to break your code. Your external CSS will not start restyling it. Uh, the, the JavaScript that is inside will not start raking havoc on your page and so on. Um, what else? Here we see how we injected the content. So remember, I had my paper element with an image in it, and that image went somewhere. So there is this content tag with a selector. Here, select equals image that says, Take all the DOM I have inside of my element on the user side and look for an image and put it here. That's what it did. 
And actually at the end I have a, a, an empty content tag which means take everything that has not been selected and, and just dump it there. This I can actually show you. If I put more stuff here, more stuff, well, it dumps more stuff down in the, in the component. All right, what else? Now data binding. Now this is really interesting. So remember the heading I had? Now my heading, this is how I inject it where I want to have it in the code itself. I use those double braces, the mustaches. Uh, this data binding, by the way, is two ways. So if you're injecting stuff into an input field, it will work two ways. And finally, here at the end, I have a piece of script. So this piece is Polymer specific. You call the Polymer function, and in it, you define what is actually the prototype of your element. So here you can define, you can initialize any member variables, you can initialize, oh, sorry, you can define any member functions you want, and so on. And you also have predefined hooks uh, that are called by default by Polymer, for example, attached, uh, that one is called when your element is actually placed in your page somewhere. All right. I hope it makes a little bit more sense now. But this, isn't a pretty, is, this is not a pretty slide. All right, but this is, today I, I don't want to explain to you exactly how to make a polymer element more how to use them. So let's go back to our, our application and let's try to use more paper elements. Now I want to, to build a real application. So I import a bunch more stuff. What do I want? So let's start with a core header panel. All right. And in my panel, I want a core toolbar. All right. What is this? Oh, I have a toolbar. This is not really so interesting yet. Let's put some more images here. All right. So here I have an application and, wow, you see what's happening. This, the functionality I just get, I just got with the header uh, panel is uh, an area that is scrollable and a toolbar area that is fixed here. Well, that's nice, but this toolbar looks a little bit empty. Let's, let's fill it with more stuff. Or actually before that, oh yeah, there is something else I want to show you. Look at this syntax and please don't shout yet. Div lay. Layout, uh, vertical, center. Refresh. Ooh, what just happened? Let's try something else. Horizontal uh, wrap. Ooh. So, this is, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> this is just syntactic sugar. This is specific to Polymer. It's syntactic sugar on top of the Flexbox. It's just a super nice and easy way of using the Flexbox. Um, any um, uh, element you can think of, as soon as it has an attribute layout, it means this is a Flexbox. And inside, you can have horizontal layout, vertical layout. And of course, well, you can use the, the, you know, the magical flex power of the flex box. Let's say my second element, I tell it it's flex. Boom, the second element takes more space because that's the flexible element in the space, in the, in the page. All right, this was just a little parenthesis because I 
I love this stuff. Uh, so I was about of putting more stuff into my toolbar. Let's put a paper icon button uh, with an icon which is a menu. All right. Uh, what else? Uh, let me put a div where I say hello. And uh, let me add an input field. Paper input um, with some default text. Label equals type your name here. Mm -hmm. Stuff in the toolbar. Um, I told you about the floating action button. Let's add a floating action button. Paper floating action button. Icon equals cloud. You will see why in a second. All right, I'm slightly cheating here. Maybe you, you noticed that, of course. Uh, my CSS is already done. So all these elements appear with the right colors and all that. That's not magic. That's a CSS that exists. I'm not typing the CSS. I have written it before. Um, this is pretty ugly. Let's fix it. Actually, the core toolbar, core toolbar is already a flex box. So all I need to do is this. I, my hello is flex. Now it looks like a toolbar. Nice. So with this couple of lines, I have actually uh, created um, a real application. Uh, now you, you must be wondering, what is this application doing? Well, if I type my name here, I click this, it goes to the server, does magic, comes back. Um, but I, I need to extract this value from the input field. How do I do that? Well, perfectly normally, as you would in HTML. Here is my input. No, not my input. Here is my floating action button. On click equals document that query selector of uh, let's select the paper input. Okay, dot value. That's how you get the value, as if it was a totally normal input field, and it's not. It's a complicated. Um, material design paper element. Uh, just to show you that it works, let's put an alert here for the time being. All right. Reload. Uh, you notice the animation on the input box? I kind of like this one too. So, Martin, I push the button, it says hello, it says Martin, great. Um, well, at this point, I guess you're, you're sick of seeing me typing code and making mistakes. So um, let me show you by switching to another branch what this application actually does. Here you go. Uh, I have to restart my server to pick it up. All right, so here is my app. I type Martin. And the server responds, hello, Martin. That's the functionality. Thank you very much. Um, one more thing I wanted to show you. How did I actually add this paper card here now that the functionality is complete? So in my paper fab, I still have my document.querySelector paper input value and I do a call to the server with that. Um, the do call, well, the server stuff, the server basically responds with a text and an avatar ID. And I call the function display new card with the text and the avatar ID. And this is what display new card does. You can try to read through it, but actually there is absolutely nothing to see. That's the magic. This is bog standard JavaScript DOM manipulation code for adding a node into your DOM. Uh, we create an element, create element paper card. Uh, we create an image. We append the image to the element. And we actually even do card.heading equals text. 
in JavaScript that heading that I have defined as an external attribute is accessible, is usable. And then I append my card to my, uh, to my DOM as if it was any HTML tag. All right, one more thing I want to show you. You noticed I had uh, these uh, little buttons here. Uh, not functional now. How do we make them functional? Well, let me switch to a little bit more code here. Um, I have to restart my server again, sorry about that. Here we go. Now if I type Martin, it says hello Martin, and I can close my card and I can, even, yeah, I can even kill this one. Let's see how this, this, how this is implemented. And uh, this is an introduction to uh, templates and data binding. I'm just showing you the surface. Um, but I think it's interesting. So look here. Instead of my list of paper cards, I have a new element which is called greetings list. How did I define greetings list? Well, let's dig into the code. Here is greetings list. Greetings list. First of all, let's skip what is above. It takes one attribute, which is a, called list. Well, at this point, you don't know what a list is. Let's see the prototype for this element. So when it is created, it actually initiates this list as an empty array. And then I define two functions, add and delete, to this list. Well, here I will uh, say thank you to JavaScript for all of its simplicity, because the add and delete are actually the simplest piece of JavaScript you can write for inserting an element into an array and deleting an, an element from an array. Um, maybe there are some JavaScript gurus here that got this at first sight. Uh, I didn't. But that's the message. It's bog standard JavaScript for just inserting an element into an array and removing the element from the array. And now the interface is going to be updated by magic, by template magic. Here I have my Polymer element with its template, and inside I have another template, and look at this one. It's a repeated template. That template binds to G in list, so all the elements in the list. And for each of those elements, I instantiate a paper card. And I pick the heading from the G, I pick the UID from the G. Well, what is the UID for? That's simply so that when I kill a card, I know which one, okay? And uh, the avatar ID as well. And here you have a full model, the list, view, the template, and controller, which actually only controls additions and deletions from the list itself. And the, um, the UI updates happens automatically. All right, that's all I wanted to show you. Material design, uh, google.com slash design, paper elements, a whole library of them, and uh, it's up to you to play with it. Thank you. And the counter says we have two minutes for questions. Yes. Oh, yes, can I use this? Of course. <laughs> so um, if you have a look at uh, the Can I Use website for web components, um, it's quite depressive right now. I'm, no, sorry, not depressive. It's working in progress. Um, but what Polymer offers, the first level of Polymer, is actually a backfill, uh, a polyfill of all the web components features to make it work across all browsers. And then the second part of, of Polymer is the syntactic sugar about creating elements 
uh, about uh, playing in a, in a nicer way with the flex bo flexbox, about uh, data binding and so on. Um, but the first level is the polyfill. So you can take polymer today and put it in production. With a caveat, it's not 1.0, so every time you update your elements, they might break in subtle ways uh, because not everything is finalized yet. Yes? Sorry? Ah, skins. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. And that's when you create those elements, you define what is the surface. So you define what is available at the outside. So you can, for example, define that your element is available in a blue theme and a black theme with just a you know, switch as, as an attribute that says blue or black. That's one possibility. Uh, you can make it a lot more complicated, so you can actually implement a lot more complicated theming. And then, if the user is still not happy with that, uh, this is HTML, there is always ways of cheating. And this is how you cheat. Actually, in CSS, look on the right side, uh, you have two CSS modifiers that can be used to punch through the shadow DOM and go style the innards of, 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 a, of, a, of a polymer element from the outside. So this is completely forbidden. You should never do this, but this is how you do it. And right now, with all the paper elements I'm using, um, I did this quite a lot. I should not have to do it when they are all properly themable and styleable. But if I show you my CSS, well, look here. The paper input to make it play nice with my white on blue uh, toolbar, a lot of slash deep slash. Do we have time for a last question, maybe? I can't see you, so shout if you have one. Yes. So the, what is the data binding framework? Uh, it's a part of Polymer. And, and, and let's go back to the code, because I just remembered there is something I didn't show you. Um, yeah, here. So the data bindings, uh, you might have wondered here why there were double braces and double square brackets. That's just a detail, don't worry about it. The double braces are two-way bindings, and the double square brackets are one-way. So just take the value and put it here. Uh, the double braces actually add event handlers so that this becomes a two-way data binding. It's slightly more efficient uh, where it's possible to use a simple data binding, so square brackets. But yes, that data binding model is built into Polymer. It's one of the added values of the Polymer programming model, well, of the programming model that Polymer suggests to you. Okay, well, I'm still here, so if you have more questions, please come, come down, and uh, thank you for staying so late. <laughs>